All right, good morning. I'm a little, uh, <clears throat> I started and didn't have anything on. That's what happens when you get old. You begin to forget to do things. So anyway, this morning, I want to uh, say that uh, this is Harbor Baptist Church. This is missionary pastor Roland Mitchum. We are for our gathering together. It's 11 o'clock for our morning service. And um, I want to thank each and every one of you that have come to be a part. We are this morning in James chapter 4. James chapter 4. So if you'd go ahead and open your Bibles to James chapter 4. We're looking at verses 7 through 10. <clears throat> in verses 7 through 10, let me go ahead and read the verses. <clears throat> Verse 7, chapter 4. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. A very um, uh, intense four verses in that this one is packed full of commands. So verse 7 has to, it says, submit yourselves, resist the devil. Verse 8 has 3, draw nigh to God, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. Verse 9 has 4, be afflicted, mourn, weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning. And 10 has 1, humble yourselves. So really a, a lot, a lot in here this morning. And we'll not cover it to the depth that it could be covered because <clears throat> I'm not the preacher that some people are, but uh, praise the Lord that he's given us the word of God and he's given me time to study and, and he has met with me and we do have a word from God, uh, meaning he has something to teach us from this passage today. And so uh, James 4 through 7, I titled this Honorable Commands. Um, and really the purpose that I see uh, for these commands and the, the message that we have today is, is that God designs, has designed this to be a help to the believer in, uh, to be in the path to being exalted by God. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways that we can walk, but there's only one way, and that's God's way that we can walk and be blessed and honored by him. And so let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you again for the word of God. We thank you that as we open the word and, and sincerely open our hearts and minds to, to the word and its teachings, that you will meet with us, that the spirit of God, he that indwells us, will teach us, illuminate us, and guide us into all righteousness and all truth. We ask that that be uh, what happens in each and every time that we gather together and open the word of God, that you're glorified that you allow your spirit, the spirit of God, to, to work in our hearts as only he can do, changing us for eternity's sake and bringing us in closer fellowship and communion with you. We ask now for your blessings on our time. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> uh, I have uh, had the privilege uh, in the ministry to listen to people, a lot of people, and I realized a truth um, that exists in their lives exists even in my own life. Uh, people are spiritually lazy. Um, even if they are achievers in life, they are lazy in spiritual things. Um, not only are they lazy, but there sometimes there seems to be a dearth of understanding uh, when it comes to spiritual truths. And that's understandable in that we are made in corruption. We are carnal uh, made in flesh, that means that we have a carnal side to us. We have a, a natural man. <clears throat> I think maybe this is the possible, this is a possible reason why we're called sheep, um, along with God giving us shepherds, uh, as well as so many commands to direct our lives unto godliness. Now, God desires all men to come to the knowledge of salvation. And once they do, he continues to help them on to greater spiritual growth. But in order for that to happen, we have to spend time in the, in the Word of God and with Him. Um, 
he has in his word, uh, as I mentioned here, given us commands revealing how we might uh, live in, in, in an order um, or live in a way that we would receive the blessings of God or can receive the blessings of God uh, owned in, in our lives. Um, he tells us when uh, we live according to his word and by his way, if you look up in, in 10, it says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. So we live according to us, his way. He will lift us up. He, God, uh, will exalt us. The idea is he will honor us. <clears throat> it does not say when in our, uh, in our passage um, that God will do this honoring and exalted. But my personal belief, my opinion is that God will exalt us firstly before men. And, 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 and he will honor us on this earth, but also in heaven for living a godly life um, as a testimony to him and, and for him among men. <clears throat> really, the question that I get here is not, will God honor us, but will we live a life honorable to him? And so as we enter in today, the, the, the title is Honorable Commands. And I got three things, or God's given three things that I think that, that we will address today. The first one is God commands the believer to submit to his control and will. Now that sounds bad, but are we not supposed to surrender the will of the flesh to the Spirit of God? So that's under his control. So to his control and will. And control and will, it kind of sounds like the same thing, but there's a nuance of difference, and I'm just going to leave it at that. God commands the believer to submit to his control and his will. And the second thing, or second point, is God commands the believer to join themselves unto him. And we'll talk about that in a little more depth, um, <clears throat> give you a little more insight of why I put it like that. Uh, God, the point number three is God commands the believer to be broken because of their sin. And we will see that in verse nine. So as we start out, <clears throat> verse one, God commands the believer to submit to his control and his will. Look in James 4, 7. He says, submit yourselves. That's a command. Submit yourselves, therefore, because of what? Uh, he's listed before, and I think especially verse 1, from whence comes wars and fightings among you, come they not hence, even from the lust of your uh, that war in your members. He said, therefore, submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Um, uh, to be in submission is more than just listening to advice. It requires you to follow it. You know, a lot of people, um, I'm sure, come to church on Sundays, and, and they hear the preaching of the Word of God, and they go away thumping their chest. I've done my part. I've done my part. I've been good. I'm godly. Well, you've listened to it. Now, have you applied it? Um, see, submission to the Word of God is more than just listening to the advice or to the Word of God. It's, it's, it's the drawing away from the flesh. It's the drawing closer to God, the separating ourselves from sinful practices and separating ourselves unto godly practices in our life. A simple way to judge just how uh, submissive you're being, and this is on the very basic step, is here's the question you ask yourself. Am I having devotions daily? When I get up in the morning, I always say in the morning because God gets first fruits. When I get up in the morning, do I sleep in and then I have to be rushed to do what I'm doing? Uh, when I get up in the morning, it's the first thing on my mind reading my Bible and praying and spending time with God. Is that the first thing on your mind? Or is it something else? Well, i got to have my coffee first or I can't read my Bible. Well, you know what? If I don't eat, I can't read my Bible. Now, it reminds me of the dog. When uh, you see something he doesn't understand, he turns his head one way and then he keeps looking and turns himself the other. Uh, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, the thing that you need the most, you should have to have your Bible before you can drink your coffee. You should have to have your Bible before you eat the meal. I remember there was a group in a uh, uh, family in, in, in school that said, no Bible, no breakfast. Tremendous, tremendous. <clears throat> but those that will draw unto God, um, you need to understand, if you won't shelter uh from attacks of the flesh, that shelters in him, and you need to draw into him. 
If you want the shelter, you need to get close to God. You can't say, well, you know, I, I, I it was raining out there and I just got soaking wet. I guess my roof was no good if you're standing out in the middle of the yard. You got to get under the shelter. You got to get under the shade. You got to get where it actually protects you. You can't just say, well, I have one. I'm protected. Doesn't work like that. That's the mechanics of it, if you would. That's the principle. <clears throat> See, I hope you understand um, that the, the more uh, there's a stronger need of that shelter of, of, of drawing closer to God when you're being attacked. And, and the more you're attacked, I, I would pray, I would hope you would understand there is, that need is increased and, and strengthened. And instead of saying, well, God's not doing anything and backing away, that you would draw closer and get under the shelter of his wings, that you would uh, spend more time with him, that you might have victory through those attacks. Um, the strength of, of, of any believer is in your determination or in that determination uh, to be uh, in God's word and to be walking with God. If you don't have that determination, you have no strength, spiritually speaking, uh, and you're not going to have any victories. <clears throat> I guess the synopsis of what I'm trying to say here is uh, to believe and not obey the word is never submission to God or his word. Um, just, I believe that he is God, but you know I'm going to do things my own way. I'm sorry, it, it, obedience, the very definition of obedience is it's a decision to place your will into subjection to God's will. And that's what he says, submit yourselves, therefore. I'm commanding you to make a decision to decide to subject yourself to the authority of the word of God. That's basically the essence of it. But you say, no. I'm not going to do that, then you have rejected God's command. You've rejected his authority and you now hinder him from being a blessing in your life and you cannot enjoy his protection against those things which attack you. Have you ever wondered why you're, you, you seem like you're always under spiritual attack? Well, it could be that you're just not an obedient Christian. could be you're not saved too, but I would imagine it's probably closer to you, not a spiritual Christian. You're not obedient to what the word says. <clears throat> so again, obedience is a deliberate decision by the individual to act in obedience to the word of God. So we got that. Uh, there's a little bit of information on this. God's not going to force you to submit to his authority. If you haven't figured it out by now, it's an individual thing. You recognize it or you don't. Now, does that authority exist? You better believe it. It's just like getting out there and, and driving 150 mile an hour on a road that says you're supposed to go 60. Uh, the, the authority's there. Well, I got away with it for the last week. Well, you tell that to the policeman when he stops you and see what happens. And let him tell it to the judge when he's fine you and see what happens. The authority's there. You rejected it, and because of that, you'll pay the price. Uh, you're not supposed to rob banks either. You're not supposed to kill people. There's a lot of things you're not supposed to do, people do anyway. Well, sooner or later, they're going to pay for that. Well, they may get through with it in this life. You know, men's law is there, but not every violation of it is always caught. <clears throat> but there's a good chance the more you do, the, the greater chance you'll get caught. But you have to recognize that authority to be protected by it. Um, <clears throat> what God commands, uh, his children is really is just to enable his blessings on us. Um, when he commands something, he doesn't uh, command that, that we do something we cannot. What he commands uh, allows us to be in the will of God, be obedient to God, and thereby have an open path to the blessings and how he, he can minister to us if you would. Uh, he commands submission since that is one of the key ways of resisting the influence of the devil. You say, what do you mean? That's how we resist the influence of the devil. Well, if you're in submission to God, you cannot be in submission to wickedness. You're contrary one to another. So as we submit to God, and he commands that to be so, we are actually resisting the devil. No one can live a righteous or live righteous 
uh, and I'll say before God, if there's no resistance to the wiles and influences of the devil. They're just contrary. You just can't have it. So when we submit to God, that enables us, not only are we actually already doing resistance to the devil or participating in that, but it actually increases our ability to resist him because we become instructed in righteousness. And because of that, in our pleasing of God, I believe we get the protection of God on us. He begins to open our eyes. The more we're willing to do, the more he reveals and illuminates to us and the more we're able to resist and the closer we can draw to God and the further away. You understand, it's a, there's a principle there. It's reciprocal. So the closer we are to God, the greater we can recognize the temptations of Satan and the greater uh, ability we have to recognize those, the greater we have uh, to avoid those uh, temptations. See, <clears throat> I think, it's obvious, and at least I hope it is, it would be for most anybody, um, the more the dangers can be seen, uh, the easier it is to avoid those and protect ourselves uh, from them. A little child may not realize that that stove is hot, but once they get burned or we teach them that it's hot, then they recognize that danger. It's easier to, for them to understand and see it and then to avoid it and not be burned again. <clears throat> now. And then we have the natural man. Uh, the natural man really, in essence, has a limited ability to resist Satan because he doesn't have the indwelling spirit. You know, how can he submit himself to God or submit himself to God if he doesn't have the indwelling spirit? Well, that would be salvation, wouldn't it? But if he does not have salvation, how can he submit himself? If you go back to Isaiah, it says, all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags, meaning we of ourselves neither have the ability, and, and I, I'll take it further, nor the desire to resist wickedness. Uh, we don't have a desire uh, to really to be righteous before God. We think that we've done good. You know, I've, uh, I've done good. I've helped that person. That should weigh against the evils. Of, no. It doesn't work like that. We, there's no scale. You either have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior or you're not. This is a, a truth and consequence type deal. This is a fact versus fiction type deal. There is no scales. You, know, you say, well, they do that in law. Well, yeah, but law is not a proper representation. Man's law is not a proper representation of God's law. It is a representation of authority, but not a proper. Or maybe I should use the word complete. Because men are fallible. God is not. So what we have is fact and fiction. Hey, listen, you either accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior and submit unto him, or you don't. You're not going to weigh out anything before God. When you come before God, the books are open, the facts are there, and he will judge. That's it. <clears throat> so get rid of that fallacy and go back to the fact. So without understanding or resistance, what happens to those people that are unsaved? Well, technically, and I, this is probably not the best way to put it, but it, it, I think it carries the idea, they become the devil's playground because they're, they're, they're ignorant of the wiles of the devil. They don't understand how to protect themselves or to avoid these dangers. They don't understand to resist them. It's not a threat to them. So they become his playground. And, and if you look in our world today and, and look what people deem as okay, even in a lot of Christian, so-called Christian circles, Christian churches, um, <clears throat> and a big one to me always goes back to the, the music, these people. Um, there was a, a man, the clay pots or something, referencing um, that we are vessels and, you know, well, they're not the vessels they think they are if they're paying rock and roll music. They could be saved. I'm not going to say they're not, but they're definitely not serving God with that kind of music. This doesn't happen, but that's between them and God. I would say they don't have the understanding. But anyway, <clears throat> spiritual men uh, are different. They have a spiritual sight because they do have um, the indwelling spirit because they have believed in Jesus Christ and placed their faith in him, or they couldn't be spiritual. Okay, now you can have those that have accepted Christ that are not spiritual, but they're spiritual men. So these are the ones that should be submitting unto God. All believers actually should be submitting unto God. 
I'll make two more statements and we'll move on to the next point. Um, the key to victory over sin is to resist sin and in that resistance gain power over that. Now, understand what I just said. The key to victory over sin is resistance to sin and in resistance or continual resisting of that sin, you gain power over it. Um, uh, I've had things in, in my life and, and I can remember there was such a struggle to get a hold of, especially my tongue. Um, and I had to keep praying about it. And, and the more I prayed about getting rid of that tongue, the more sensitive I became when I said something. And the more sensitive I become, the more of a mark it would make on me. And the more sensitive I would, uh, and it would enhance it again. And, and then I, would, I was conscious. I'd become conscious of this thing um, until I finally got victory over it. And, and that's the deal. Uh, the path to victory over sin uh, is still always in obedience to the word of God, but we have to uh, resist it. And that's part of it. He says, resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're into a sin and you're trying to get victory, I'll ask you this. How many times do you pray about it? If you tell me I pray about it every morning and that's it, you're wrong. Every time that that sin comes into your mind, every time that that broaches uh, or comes out, I, I guess I should say that actually you commit it, whether it be one or 10,000 times in a day, you should pray about it. If it's a temptation to it, pray God to relieve me from it. And you can, and I don't care if you just sit there and continue praying that, but you continue to bring that before God until that passes. And then if you're in the middle of it, you seek forgiveness immediately. The moment you catch yourself and continue to ask God to bless you. That's the only way you can get victory, really. It's a continual attack on you, and you have to continually attack it through the word of God and by the power of God. And that's how you get it. Well, God, forgive me of this thought. Help me to have victory over this. Lord, I'm in the middle of this. I've already started doing this. Uh, forgive me. I'm putting it away. And I, I like to have victory over this. Lord, help me to get all close. You see what I'm saying? And so you need to remember the path to, to victory over sin is always in obedience to his word. It's always by resistance. <clears throat> the second um, uh, command, God commands the believer to join themselves on him. Look at 4.8. It says, draw nigh to God. This is a command. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. This is a principle I just set forth at the end of verse 7 here about that resistance. He said, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. It says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Uh, again, this is really a lot in relation to what I've just said. God's desire for each of his children is to be more than just a believer. And, and when I said God commands the believer to join themselves unto him, that's the idea. He wants you to do more than just believe. What he desires is for you as a child of God to be part of a him in a way that's inseparable from him. So not only have you the indwelling spirit, and you are inseparable, but he wants, and that's what he's given to you, but he wants you to give yourself back to him in a way that's inseparable to you. It's already inseparable to him. Okay, he will never leave or forsake you, but he wants the same from you. He wants you to be more than just a believer. That requires us as a child of God to prevent anything in our life from being in between God and us. He says, draw nigh to God. The command is to draw nigh and he will draw nigh to you. How do you draw nigh to God? You have to stop those things. Again, remember the, what I just said about praying about your sin and all? That's stopping it. That's working to prevent them. Now, you'll find that once this happens, you'll have other things come up. Uh, God will reveal more. He'll, he'll go through something, then he'll reveal more. Um, <clears throat> we really have lost the understanding, I guess. Uh, we really do not... Um, hold on, if you will, we don't keep in our lives the importance of maintaining a focus on a life in Christ. We, um, we have, and I've used this word a lot today, 
<clears throat> mechanics. Um, in, in mechanics, I'm simply saying um, there's a way things work. Um, and we have placed more on, on the practice of the mechanics than we have an actual relationship with God. So if we go to church, we are good Christians. That's what we say. Every good Christian goes to church. Well, would not, not it be better to say that every good Christian has a relationship with God? See, which one's more true? We have lost people in churches. And just because they go to church every day doesn't mean, or every time the door's open, that doesn't make them a good Christian. A good Christian is determined by our relationship with God. And that's what it's determined by. And we have gotten so everything is a mechanic to us. It's something we can do. Work salvation whether you realize it or not. That's not salvation. Salvation cometh by faith. You know, we place our faith. Whosoever believeth in him. So here it says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Let me use the word mechanics one more time. This is spiritual mechanics. You draw away from the world and draw to God, and God will draw to you. He will increase his presence. He will increase his working in your life. Then it tells us how to draw nigh. It says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. What we need to do is we need to recognize there are things that are beginning to draw or have already drawn our hearts from Christ. There are some things that they may not be wicked. They may not even be bad but they're dangerous to spiritual growth. It is these things that are the biggest threats of opening you up and are opening you up to the greatest dangers. Now, let me illustrate. This just happened in my uh, life recently. Um, I love to work wood. Totally enjoy it. And, and I had this one tool that's been on my mind I really won't, and there's, it would make uh, some of the things I do with my hands, it was so much better. The quality would increase. So this has been a desire of my heart. And God brought it to bear about two weeks ago that I was loving or desiring, I should say, I was desiring this tool more than I was the souls of men. Wow. That hurt. But it was right. That thing, huh, was it wrong? That thing had begun to consume me because I wanted it so bad. And God told me, just as simple as this, he says, you want that more than you want to see souls saved. And immediately I repented. Why? Because I had allowed something, while it was not bad, it was not wicked, it was dangerous to my spiritual growth. Not only that, but it had become the biggest threat and was opening me up to so many dangers, leading me away from where my heart should have been and on what it should have been resting. And it's just that easy. See, it's those things that we don't identify as threats. It's those things that just slip in unawares, if you would, and then captivate our thoughts those things, while they're not bad, captivate us and take us captive. And while we're looking for the wickedness, we fail to see what it has done. The principle here is, if we have given anything a higher value in our sight, in our estimation, than God or the things of God, <coughs> we have been drawn away. It's interesting that this has happened because I had told my wife, Something's going on. I'm struggling with this. I am not getting the clarity that I need to have. Um, there's a problem, and then God revealed that. That's how it works. <clears throat> Things uh, can prevent God from being as close as he desires to you um, because he's not your love. He's not my love. And so because of that, that caused a problem. Um, here, there's a reason for this commandment to draw nigh. Um, he doesn't want you to allow this to happen. He wants to draw towards you, but you need to draw towards him. And if you will obey in that drawing, he will respond to that drawing. What a tremendous principle that is, that God will respond. It's not his fault if we're not as close to God as we should be or wish to be. It's our fault. You see, 
if you're unwilling to cleanse your hands, if you're unwilling to cleanse your life of the things that God does not approve of, not that they're wicked, but they've drawn your heart away, it's not his fault. We're at fault. Those who are unwilling to set aside that which is blocking or hindering uh, or hindering their relationship with God, they're never going to have the relationship God wants with them. They're never going to, to grow in the grace and knowledge that they should grow in. There may be some limited growth here and there. But see, that's the heart uh, problem. That's an issue. That's a, a spiritual issue. That's a spiritual problem. Um, I tell you this to let you know how easy. It's a shame for me that I, I let myself get in that position. Didn't even realize it was happening until it already happened and, and did not know it until God revealed it. Um, we need to keep our hearts right before him. We need to cleanse our ways. It says here, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. See, I was double-minded. Serving God and serving self, if you would. Seeking after the, something that would make me happy. And I had not, I just preached on that too long ago, that uh, these uh, temporal things, you can keep getting them, but they're not going to make give you joy. They'll give you temporary happiness. And the moment you get that, then you look for something else. I, I just got through preaching it. And yet I had the old problem in my own heart. How much? of these problems do we face every day or how much of this is in our hearts because we are a corruptible being, because we're in a world that is, is not of God, it's hostile to the things. How much do we have that we're not seeing? Probably more than we, we realize, really. You know. um, the extent that we're willing to remove the things from our lives reveals just how great a heart we have or how great a desire in our heart we have for God. Um, there may be something that you love in your life that God's going to ask you to remove. It's not bad. Not bad at all. But if you're going to enjoy a better relationship with him, you better seek to move it. If you don't, your relationship with God's going to stagnate. It's going to stagnate. And you're going to feel that. If you've been growing in Christ, you're going to feel that. You're going to feel that something's wrong, and you better, the moment you start feeling that, you need to start um, praying and asking God to show you what it is so you can get rid of it. Um, and when he shows you, you better not hesitate, because then you know you have a greater accountability to get rid of it. I just praise the Lord he's willing to do that, that he's willing to open your eyes to see. I have found out also in watching people the greater the desire for God, the greater the extremes they go to or people will go to to achieve uh, get that desire fulfilled. And I hope that God has cultivated in you a, a, a tremendous desire uh, for God. And I hope that you're willing to go to whatever it takes to be right with God. Sometimes um, we have to, what I would call pay to piper. In other words, it's pretty uh, tough uh, uh, situation we're in because of the sin and we just have to face the music we have to just do what's right and, and God commands and, and just trust him for it there will be people uh, that get to be Christians that will have sins that uh, maybe they've uh, done something and, and they have to serve time for it uh, just trust the Lord he can work in all those situations not making it easy but we are accountable and sometimes God will just get us out of those but not always <clears throat> let me make this statement and just say if a person's relationship with God is not what it could be then neither is their desire for God if your relationship if my relationship with God is not what it should be or could be then neither is our desire for God what it should be or could be um, to have a relationship, uh, have the relationship God desires, um, it's going to require a continual daily walk. It's going to require discipline. So you have to make up your mind. You have to decide, this is what I'm going to do each and every morning. Let me encourage you to do that now. Take a little time. Ask God to, to give you a time in the morning and a place in your house. And you go there every morning. Spend some time with God. And you'll find at first that you may not um, have a, an ability to spend a lot. Your devotions may be over quicker, but they'll grow. 
Each day is a new day of walking with God, and each day is a new day that we can have growth. But each day is going to be a day that there's going to be sacrifices to have that, to grow in God, to have that time with God. Um, let me also apply that with this. Um, we've talked about strongholds before and those besetting sins in our life. I mentioned to you earlier about how we address that um, uh, and get rid of these sins. But some of these things that are ingrained so deep are strongholds, and we remove those strongholds the same way. Each day being a new day, walking with God, uh, seeking to grow, sacrificing, and praying for those things, those strongholds, those thoughts, or whatever it is that's got you continually. Um, asking God to remove them, asking him to become the center of our lives. And eventually, they'll be removed. Strongholds are not an occasional sin. Those are things that are pretty locked down in our life and take a sometimes a long time to get victory over. But don't be discouraged. Um, whatever it is, uh, be diligent and, and be constant and consistent, if I, I guess would be the word, in attacking that problem. So the last, the last point is this. God commands the believer to be broken over their sin. I am. This was really an interesting one because in 9 it says this. Be afflicted <clears throat> and mourn and weep. Again, when God gives us a command, um, it's always something that the individual can do. And here in this passage, he's commanding the individual to be grieved by their sinful actions. Uh, this command uh, reveals some things to us. First of all, it reveals that the individual controls the manner in which a sin that they have committed or are committing is viewed. And so uh, what he's telling us is that we have the ability to change our mindset. We have the ability to change our view and opinion of sin or that sin or whatever you want to say, but any sin really so it says, be afflicted. You are to afflict yourself. You are to bring yourself to a place of uh, remorse, if you would. You are to uh, bring yourself to a place where you do not view that sin in a positive manner. He says, mourn. You There should be some weeping. There's some grieving. There should be a heavy heart. You should be, in a way, um, you should be in a way where, where you are so grieved by the sin that you can't hide it. So if God's commanding the believer to change the way they view sin, there's some keys to that. Uh, I think the first one is, if you're going to change your view or opinion of sin, first of all, you got to have a, a willing heart. So when you look at something, and let's just, uh, let's take the, the alcoholic or, or those that smoke cigarettes or, or whatever it is, and, and I, I do those too because those come up, the first things that come to mind, I was trying to think of something else. Um, but we get into these things and, and, and we enjoy them. And I've done both. I've uh, been a drinker and smoker and, and, and other things as well. But you get so you enjoy them. And what happens is you say, well, you know, it's just a little thing. There's really nothing wrong with it, you know. I know, you know, but every now and then, and, and you begin to make excuses. No, you have to change the way you view it. You have to change your opinion, um, and, and in order that, you really got to determine to do it. In other words, you have to have a willing heart. And so if you don't, if you don't want to change your opinion, you're not going to. So how do you change your opinion? Well, you have to be willing to see sin as God sees it. The first of all, it can't, it can't be seen as something that's going to bring pleasure. It's got to be seen, seen as something that's going to bring hardships, turmoil, agony. You know, it's got to be seen negatively because that's how God sees it. The first of all, I want you to understand that God sees sin as that which separates you from him. God doesn't want to be separated from you. That's a negative to him. Um, uh, so we have to learn. And so God says, you need to be afflicted over this. You need to see just what kind of destruction it's doing in your life. You need to mourn and wail. And people need to understand just how broken you are. You need to be so broken that you weep 
because you've committed these sins, because of the effects it's had on others. <coughs> Look at this next one. It says, let your laughter be turned to mourning. See, that's the idea that we've taken pleasure. You know, you get, a, you get around a, a drunk sometime or, or people on drugs, and they're all happy-go-lucky. They're, 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 they're having all this fun and they're enjoying themselves. God says, let that laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. He says, you need to realize the impact that these things are having on you. You smoke cigarettes long enough, they're going to destroy your lungs. You drink heavy enough and long enough, very well could give you uh, destroy your liver and kill you. Any sin can destroy you in your walk with God. Some of them are more physically oppressive than others. But you understand what I'm saying here. It can't be seen as something that will bring pleasure. You've got to look at the negative. As long as you look at the positive side, as long as you look at it through the sensual man and your desires, you will never look at it like God. You will never have a willing heart to, to separate from it. You have to change your view, and you have to do that by seeing how God looks at it and incorporating that. That's the only way you can do it. It's impossible to do it otherwise. God... Um, uh, want you to understand the destructive nature of sin. And once you do that, you will begin to turn away. Now, I'm not saying it's instantaneous. Um, it took me a while to to turn uh, my life around with, with the, the cursing. Um, God took the drinking. He took the cigarettes immediately, took the drugs, all that immediately. But it took a while to turn that around. And you say, well, that wasn't so destructive. Well, it was very destructive for my testimony for Christ. You can't lead a person to God if the next thing you're doing is, is flipping out these, these vulgar words. You just can't do it. Um, you're losing your temper and things. You just can't do it. It's destructive to it. And so you have to see these truths and begin to teach yourselves to be distressed and saddened by sin. Now, you say, I can't do that. Well, God says you can. He said, be afflicted, mourn, and weep. He said, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaven. That's a command. Uh, allow God to to begin to turn these things in your life. Um, but in order to allow him, you must decide to look at it like God looks at it. You know, and, and, and that's a delicate thing because you could, you could turn that around in a heartbeat. See, the problem with the lost is they see pleasure in sin. They don't see the cost it exacts on them. And they may live a life with all the blessings and monies that, that this old flesh can afford and, and never have to pay out a penny. They may live to be 150, but one day they'll pass away. And when they do, sin will exact the cost on them before the throne of God. You're going to pay the piper. There's a cost for sin. You may not see it. But it's important that we see um, uh, that it is going to exact a cost on you. God wants us as men to see the cost, so we will mourn over our sinfulness. It's important, it's very important to see sin as God sees it. We're never going to separate from it. It's always going to be a part of our life. And see, that's the whole idea of, of praying and, and, and getting victory so God can show us something else in our life that is sinned against him so we can get victory over that. Because we have to see it. There may be something in your life now that you've had in your life for years. And you don't see it as sin. But one day God may say, okay, now I'm touching on that and telling you it's time to get rid of that. Now that's, you have to get rid of it for my glory. And you have to see it as he sees it. Um, really <clears throat> talking about this, and this is just an off thought. I think uh, too many believers speak of, of of what they enjoy without ever thinking of what it costs them. You know, um, we um, and we don't do it anymore, but, but you know, we probably do other things that are similar. Um, we enjoy a lot of the pleasures as if life, uh, whether it be candy or, or sodas or whatever it is, we, and really nations spend millions of dollars on the people on it. And how much uh, could we have given to the Lord for missionaries or other things when we could have turned that? Um, we enjoy without thinking of the cost. You say, well, that didn't, 
you know, I was entitled. I'm not saying you're not, but because maybe a missionary couldn't get to the field, people were unsaved, never got saved. And you understand what I'm saying? It's just a thought there. It's tongue in cheek, not thought through, just a thought uh, come up. <clears throat> you know, I think what I'm trying to drive there is there's just too many unwilling to grieve over sin. Um, and a lot of that sin is destroying the lives of believers. Um, we should have a grief for sin. We should have a grief that other people see that we just grieve uh, over things that are destroying the lives of men. We should grieve that there's a lack of godliness because without that, there's never going to be a separation from wickedness. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I'm just going to say this statement. We'll go on and close. Uh, if you never develop a grief for sin, you'll never des de develop a, a desire for godliness. In a nutshell. In closing, as we mentioned before, an unwillingness to sacrifice is going to prevent the relationship God desires with you. And every 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 child of God is going to have to choose um, to remove these sinful actions and things that have the power over them if they're going to live a victorious life in Christ. Uh, I kind of wrote down a little four-step program to help you gain the victory in your Christian life. And I know I'm going a little long, but I, I really want to give this to you. Um, <clears throat> But I want you to understand this is one step at a time. Uh, so anyway, the first step is to learn obedience to Christ. And, and, and the walk of obedience has always begun by being baptized and then a continual um, daily surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit. The second step is to begin a daily time with God in the Word and in prayer. The third step is to begin meditating on the Word of God. Verses maybe God has laid on your hearts, heart or, 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 or something that will help you in battling some specific problem you have in your life. And the fourth step is to begin to remove any known habits that are not Christ-like or unbecoming of him. And I hope you understand that when I say that fourth step, and, and really, this is a lifelong thing. And the more we're, we're doing this, the closer we get to God, the more we grow in him. Um, <clears throat> the whole question, it, it comes down to this for, for each individual in Christ. Do you want the victory enough to heed the commands of God? Well, if you do, and your desire, and that's your desire, then James 4.10 is for you. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Okay, if you do, if that's what you're wanting, then humble yourselves. And this, my friends, 7 through 9, is the process to humbling yourself before God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for what you've given us. We thank you for the word of God. We ask now the Lord to be glorified, honored, and uplifted with all that we say and do. Oh, Lord, help us to put you on the center of our, the throne of our hearts and that you would always have that place. Father, we praise you. We ask you now to take possession of our lives that we may be the child of God you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, I know I went a little long, um, but uh, thank you so much for staying with us, and uh, God bless. <laughs>